Imagine you're on a road trip. You hit construction and your GPS takes you in circles, bringing you right back to where you started over and over again. Frustrating to say the least. Similarly, when a destination address is not known, broadcast messages get sent out and the network data can get stuck in a loop. This uses precious resources and the data doesn't reach its destination. This can be even more problematic when stacking switches. In this episode of Cisco Tech Talk, I'll explain how to prevent loops using the spanning tree protocol, SDP, on three or more Cisco business switches. SDP is an essential network protocol used to prevent looping within a network topology. As you can see here, this network diagram shows a simple network with two switches and two computers. When the switches are connected with one cable, it can be a point of failure. So to ensure that the network has a better chance of staying up and running, you can add a second cable. This adds some redundancy, which is good. However, this can create loops. In this example, if computer one sends an address resolution protocol, ARP, request looking for computer two, switch one will send out a broadcast on all interfaces except where it was received from computer one. This means switch two will see both broadcast frames. So switch two will receive one of the broadcast frames on port one and will send it out to port two. Likewise, the frames received on port two will be sent on port one. The other switch will behave in the same manner, back and forth, forming a loop. The packets will continue going back and forth until you either disconnect one of the cables or one of the switches crashes, overwhelmed with all the traffic that's coming back. STP will help the network become free of loops. Let me show you how this happens. This diagram shows three connected switches. To keep things simple, I have labeled the MAC addresses as AAA, triple B and triple C without STB. Without STP, there would be loops. However, as a default setting on CBS switches, STP is enabled. Therefore, special frames called bridge protocol data units, BPDUs, will be sent to each other. This frame contains the MAC address and priority called a bridge ID. Spanning tree requires this bridge ID for its calculation of the root bridge. A root bridge is a focal point in the network. All other decisions, such as which port to block and which port to put in forwarding mode, are made from the perspective of this root bridge. To see the spanning tree settings, log into the switch and navigate to spanning tree. Under STP status and global settings, make sure the spanning tree state is enabled. STP loopback guard is not enabled by default. This feature provides additional protection against layer two forwarding loops regarding not receiving BPDUs. If enabled, it can cause more traffic congestion on the switch. I'll leave it disabled. The STP operation mode is set to classic STP, but there are other options available. You can check out the CBS admin guide for more information on these options. The BPDU handling is grayed out and set to flooding. You cannot change this when spanning tree is enabled. Flooding is when packets go out to all the switches. If you disabled spanning tree, you will then have the option to select flooding or filtering. This means the BPDUs are only going to get forwarded or filtered. This is not recommended. Next, the path cost default value is in long mode by default, but you also have the option to select short. This refers to the 16 or 32-bit value that provides for the speed of the interfaces. The long version can account for more options if the speed increases. Under bridge settings is the priority. The default value is 32,768. The hello time has a default of two seconds, which means a BPDU is sent that often. The max age is set to 20 seconds. If you do not receive a BPDU for this time frame, you will know something has changed in the network and you'll need to recheck the topology. Forward delay is the timer used for the listening and learning states of the port. It will remain in each state for a duration of 15 seconds. 
Now that you know the location for the STP settings on the web UI of the switch, I'll go back to the network diagram to see what STP will do with the bridge ID. So taking the bridge IDs into consideration, it will elect a root bridge. The switch with the lowest bridge ID is preferred. As a quick reminder, 32,768 is the default priority number on all three switches. If this is the case, then the MAC address will be taken into consideration, meaning the switch with the lowest MAC address will become the root bridge. In this simple network diagram, it's AAA. Therefore, switch one will become the root bridge. The ports on the root bridge are always designated. On this diagram, the letter D represents that the switch is in a forwarding state. The other two switches can be referred to as the non-root bridges. If you need to find the root port, the shortest path to the root bridge, take a look at the speed of the interface. Each interface has a certain cost. The path with the lowest cost will be used. Here's a quick overview of the interfaces and their costs. The GE1 interface on switch two and three will be the root ports. Now you know the designated ports on the root bridge and the root ports on non-root bridges. However, a loop still exists. So you need to shut down a port between switch two and switch three to break that loop. For this scenario, GE2 on switch three needs to be shut down. Both switches have the same priorities, but triple B is the lower MAC address. To shut down the switch, you can block its port, which will break the loop. A, labeled here, stands for the alternate or non-designated port. It's blocked. Now that the port is shut down, the loop problem is solved. GE2 of switch two will be in a forward state designated as D. If you look at the designated root settings in the web interface of the switch, the bridge ID and the root bridge ID will both be AAA as switch A is the root bridge. The root port and the root path cost will both be zero because that information is for the non-root switches, which are leading to the bridge. If you look at switch two, the bridge ID will be triple B and the root bridge ID will be triple A, the MAC address of the root bridge switch one. The root port will be the port that leads to the root bridges it's going to be interface one and the root path cost will be four because this is a 1000 megabits per second speed. Finally, if you look at switch three, the bridge ID will be the MAC address triple C. The root bridge ID will be triple A. The root port again will be one and the root path cost will be four. When you navigate to STP interface settings in the web UI of the switch, you can see more information on the port and edit it if needed. The table shows the interface and if STP is enabled or disabled on it. Edge port status is displayed, and this enables or disables the fast link on the port. If fast link mode is enabled on a port, it automatically sets the forwarding state when the port link is up. Fast link, therefore, optimizes the STP protocol convergence. The options for this include enabled, disabled, or auto. The next column is BPDU handling, which is STP. The port role can be designated, alternate, or root ports. The table also shows path cost and priority of the port. By default, it's set at 128. The port state displays the current STP state of the port. It can be disabled, blocking, listening, learning, or forwarding. And then there's the designated bridge ID, designated port ID, designated cost, and forward transitions. You can select one of these interfaces and click on the edit icon to make changes. Now you know some options for STP and how to configure it on the CBS switches in your network. Data can get where it needs to go. No more loops and no more worries. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.